about the gospel. And then you know what they did? They went and looked in the scriptures to see what, what he was saying was true. Because they weren't interested in the words of Paul, the great apostle. They were interested in what Jesus said, in the truth of the gospel. So I encourage you greatly and warmly, don't trust me that much. Go to the scriptures. And anytime I'm speaking the word of the Lord, praise Jesus. Anytime it's just me, don't listen. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, let's pray as we get into the message for today. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for who you are. And for what you do, we thank you that we can come to you, that we don't have to trust the mere words of a man, but we can listen to the very word of God. We pray that you'd speak to us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, don't you hate when someone does something mean to you? You ever had that happen, didn't it? Get up your nose when someone gets at you, when someone does something that they shouldn't have, when there's things that are wrong, when someone sins against you. Have you had that happen? Or is it just me? Have you ever been the cause of that? I have, more than my share, probably. Well, one time I had a friend, he was actually a very close friend, who loved to, to correct me, rightly or wrongly, at every opportunity. At every moment, he would snugly remind me of what was right or what was wrong or what he thought was right or wrong. And it irritated me. He was such a good friend, but at times, I would not want to be around him because I thought, you know what, I just don't have the energy to put up with that. And finally, one day, I said to him, hey, I don't like that when you do that. It hurts because it says to me that you, you don't actually care about me. You just want to fix me. And he said, oh, I never noticed I was doing that. I'm so sorry. And he apologized, and guess what? We've been friends ever since. <laughs> but that's not actually the way the world wants us to do things, is it? The world tells us that when someone does something that you don't like, when someone hurts you, when someone attacks you, when someone sins against you, the correct way of dealing with them is to talk about them, especially behind their backs. That's the most effective way. Stew over it. Dig it into your life. Dwell upon the hurt and the pain that's happened. Build a grudge inside yourself till the hate is just boiling within you. And then do everything in your power to hurt them back and to teach them a valuable lesson about what happens when they cross you. Isn't that the world's way? Revenge. There's a, a wonderful show called uh, Count of Monte Cristo and a far better book. The movies you can in, in the right light. The book of Count of Monte Cristo is the story of someone who was deeply sinned against. Someone did something really, really bad. And it's the whole story of how he gets revenge. I won't ruin it because it's so good. <clears throat> but the amazing thing is at the end, after he's gotten all of his revenge, he realizes he doesn't feel any better. And in fact, he wakes up and he realizes that he has spent years of his life allowing these people to control him, to be the focus of his existence. He has made the ones who hurt him into people who have the power to ruin his life, not just for that time, but for the whole time ever after that. And he realizes that maybe he was missing something and maybe this isn't God's way. I love good old literature where God actually comes into it. <laughs> So God helpfully gives us a template to avoid the world's way of resolving conflict. And where do we find that? Well, we turn to Matthew 18, 15 to 20. I promise you guys today, if you walk away from here without feeling conviction, come back. And I'll talk to you again, okay? Because when I read this, every time, I feel convicted. When I see this, I'm looking at myself going, I'm not doing it the way I should. So I'm just warning you now. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, hey, this is a really good message for Billy down the road, or this is a really good message for that guy over there, let me tell you, this is a message for me, and this is a message for every single one of you today. So are you listening? Okay. If your brother sins against you, go beat them up. Oh, no, that's not what it says. Go tell him his fault just between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Jesus 
starts off having just talked about the parable of the lost sheep, about the importance of seeking after those who are lost, especially of caring for those who are unimportant, who are small, especially the children. And now he says, hey guys, if your brother sins, sins against you, speaking of going and seeking out the lost, if you have a lost relationship, if it's been damaged some way, if someone's done something to you, then there's something that you can do about it. And it's not seeking revenge. It's to go to them and to talk to them. Now, he starts with what kind of a person? Well, he says, your brother. This frames things for us. If your brother sins against you, if someone who loves you, if someone in the church, if someone that's close to you sins against you, does something wrong, the first thing to remember is who they are. They're not just some random schlub. They're someone you care about. They're someone you value. They're someone you love. They're not just someone you can throw away if they don't fully actualize you. But they're someone who matters. So start by framing your mind, by turning your mind to that. You have to figure out who they are before you're going to be able to deal with them rightly. Because what's the first thing the devil wants to do when someone does something against you that hurts your feelings or makes you feel bad? Well, he wants to make them the enemy. Doesn't he? Forget about this brother stuff. They're the one that hurt me. They're the one that caused the problem. And so they better suffer. <laughs> he wants us to see people that way when they've caused hurt and harm and pain in our life. You know, this is something that they do in wartime, right? I don't know if you've ever gone back and studied the history of war. But one of the first things you have to do if you want to have a successful war is you have to dehumanize the enemy. You know, in the First World War, we were fighting the Germans. Well, we weren't fighting the Germans. We were fighting the Huns. We were fighting the barbarians. We were fighting those bloodthirsty people who were going to destroy us. You know, we made fun of them. We attacked them. We, we turned them into a devil so that we could better destroy them. And the devil loves to do that with us. That's why he wants us to sit and he wants us to stew on a pain or a hurt. He wants us to take something that happened and then he wants it to grow in our lives, to take root. He wants us to take it out and look at it, kind of like Gollum with the ring. You ever watch Lord of the Rings? Sitting there on a rock, my precious, my precious. He wants us to do that with the hurt and the pain that's happened in our lives until it's the only thing we can focus on, until it takes over everything in our life. He wants it to be built up into something that is insurmountable, something that must be destroyed in order to fix the problem. And then we start looking at that other person and we say the only answer is to crush them or to fix them or to make them pay and tell them what's wrong with them. Why? Because then relationship will be broken, right? The devil's not in this game for healing. He's not in this game for help. He doesn't remind us of the hurts and the pains and the sins that others have done to us so that we can have, take them out and go, oh wow, this needs to be dealt with, and then run off and deal with them. He wants us to dwell upon them and let them grow in our lives and take over. First of all, the funny thing with that is somebody does something bad to you and then our answer is, why don't we let them control our lives? That's what we do when we sit and we dwell upon a pain or a sorrow or a hurt that's been caused. We actually make it the thing that defines us, that identifies us. I am the wounded one. I am the hurt one. I am the one with the pain and the suffering and sorrow, and that is who I am, and it's their fault. And the devil loves that kind of thing. So what's the best way to fix this, Jesus says? Well, first... Look at who they are, your brother, and then go talk to them. But when should we do this? Well, there must be an appropriate time. Two weeks after? Two months? A couple of years? You know, really give yourself time to dwell upon them enough that you know exactly what they did. Well, Jesus actually, remember back to Matthew 5, gives us the paradigm for when should we go and talk to them? Hey! If you're at the temple sacrificing, if you're right in the middle of the most important spiritual act of your life, if you're right in the middle of the most important thing that you can do, and you remember that your brother has something against you, or you remember you've got something against your brother, stop what you're doing. That doesn't matter anymore. Because 
Disunity between brothers, disunity between people in the church especially, is so serious and so bad, if there's hurt and pain between you, drop what you're doing and go and fix it. Why? Because it breaks the power of the enemy in our lives. The devil loves us to keep things inside where they can fester and grow. There was a time many, many years ago where Brian, uh, he was maybe less intelligent than he is now, and he <laughs> stuck a crayon in his nose at some point. <laughs> what we didn't realize is a piece of the wrapper of the crayon had stayed, and it festered in there. And he always had this you know, runny nose, and he seemed like he was sick, but he kept going to the doctors, and, and they said, oh, everything's fine, everything's fine, there's nothing wrong, everything's fine, everything's fine, until one day he woke up and his eye was puffed out to here. And it turned out he had an infection that had gone from his nose into his eye. And thankfully, they stopped it in time, but it was a, a couple of hours away from destroying his sight forever and possibly going into his brain and killing him. This little bit of something that had irritated and aggravated in his nose, sorry for making an example, <laughs> it had festered to the point where it just about killed him. And this is what happens when we sit on a hurt, when we let it grow, when we let it fester in our lives. It continues to hurt and to poison and to wound. Now, does it hurt and poison and wound the person that we're mad at? It kills us. Someone described bitterness really well, holding a grudge really well. It's taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. That's how stupid it is to sit and to fester on something that someone has done to you. Oh, I'm just waiting for them to die. Come on, die. Let me get that police bottle up. I'm going to drink it until you're dead. It's that silly, but it's what we do. It's a problem when we have humanity because the devil does everything in his power to keep us from just healing the wound with our brothers or our sisters. Jesus wants us to have unity. You know, I, I have that song specifically chosen. How blessed is it when brothers dwell together in unity. It's blessed. It's rich. It's full. It's healing. It's helping. And the devil says, that's the last thing I want, so I'm going to break you apart as best as I possibly can. Now, a lot of the time, surprisingly, hurts and pains and things that happen come from miscommunications, misunderstandings, things that we didn't fully get. That actually, a lot of the time, especially in the church, it's not that somebody was like, okay, how do I make this person suffer today? And then they go and do something. <laughs> Usually, someone did something without intending to, right? And when you go and you sit down and you talk to someone, hey, yesterday you seemed to have cut me off in the parking lot and it looked a little bit like you gave me the finger as you went by. <laughs> and they say, well, I didn't see you actually, and, and I was busy trying to poke at whatever was in my ceiling as I was going by. I was like, oh, well, that's really good, because here I was thinking you were a terrible person who were doing something on purpose. And actually, it was nothing like that, right? We have that happen a lot in our lives miscommunication, misunderstanding, or taking things in a way that wasn't intended. When I was working as a mechanic, I was young and I was dumb, and I borrowed one of the other mechanic's work lights. And I left it in a truck. And it drove off, and we'll never see that work light again. And I didn't really think much of it. I thought, OK, I'm going to try and find it and see if I can find it. But I hadn't found it. Well, my uncle saw that this was actually causing a problem, a bother for the guy that I'd stolen it from, or taken it from, and, and destroyed it without so much as thinking about it, right, as a young, stupid guy. So he went behind my back without saying anything because he didn't want to cause me embarrassment, slipped onto this snap-on truck, bought a new one on my account, and gave it to the guy. He was trying to help. Well, what did I do as a young idiot? How dare you do that? You went and put something on my account without my permission. I completely missed the fact that his whole heart and his whole purpose was to save me from having people talk about me behind my back, having people think I was an idiot, all these things. All I saw was this apparent affront because he'd spent my money without asking me. I miss how awesome he was because I was too stupid to see it. And so I was mad at him when he was actually trying to help him to love me. Well, let me tell you, that happens a lot in our world, doesn't it? 
We can have so many things happen that are so unhealthy or not good. And it's because of what's going on in our lives a lot of the time. Because we're caught up in seeing our own vision of the world rather than the world as it really is. And so everything that happens impacts us through that vision. I was so focused on my, you know, oh, my pocketbook, I'm making not much money, and here you've spent a hundred bucks of my money, while he was saying, hey, I'm concerned about your reputation, about how people think of you. I want you to be well-liked and well-loved. And I missed the point that a lot of the time those things matter. So where do we find the key? Well, we find it in the heart. What was people's hearts? What was the purpose of what we're doing? If their heart was good, then why should we be attacking them? And if my heart is good towards them, why would I want to? Right? When someone hurts me, and I'm acting like Jesus, I'm operating from the power of the Spirit, how am I going to respond to them? Am I going to respond with hate, judgment, demanding that they give me what, the, what they owe me because they sinned and I need to be paid back? Well, if I'm walking with the heart of Jesus, then I'm supposed to have grace, love, compassion. I'm supposed to care for that other person more than I care for myself. And that means instead of saying, I'm going to take what I think I deserve from you in order to fix myself, I go to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I need you to be my sufficiency. And then I go to my brother or sister with care and with love so that they may be restored in their relationship with Christ. You know, if someone has sinned against you, that means they've sinned. We know that sin causes a brokenness in our relationship with God. What if that person hasn't realized the sin that they've committed? What if they've done it and not even seen it? Well, don't you think they want to be free? So Jesus is saying when you go, when you see that your brother or sister is sinned, go to them not to fix them, not to repair them, not to make them pay, but go to them so that they can be restored in Christ. Go to them with as much care as Jesus Christ has for you. Who's responsible for convicting of sin and righteousness? Pastor. No. It's the Holy Spirit. He has that task. And we, as Spirit-filled people, have the job, the mission, of coming alongside one another and helping people to see what the Holy Spirit is saying. But we are not actually the ones who have the task of convicting of sin. Did you know that? Even though sometimes we want to. Well, here's a verse of the Bible that says you're bad. Whoa! That's not how we're supposed to do it. But in love we go and say, hey, have you ever considered that maybe stabbing me in the face the other day wasn't the best approach to life? And then there could be restoration. Our heart is the key to everything. If I'm going to go and talk to someone about a sin, I need to make sure I'm going in love and with the mission of restoration. Anger, hatred, malice, grudges, offendedness, bitterness, self-righteousness, all of these are poison as we're trying to deal with our brothers and sisters. All of these are saying that the other one is inferior or evil, and I'm the better person. I am righteous to stand and to look down on them in judgment. You know, Jesus made a wonderful guide for us. Judge not, lest ye be judged. For by the same measure you judge, it will be judged to you. Now that doesn't mean we can't judge. We actually are called to exercise judgment. What's he saying? What measure do you use? Are you going to use the judgment of perfection, for instance? Well, that's a hard judgment because then it's thrown back on you. Maybe you're going to use the judgment of, well, okay, but just this much and past that, all bets are off. Still not good enough. The judgment of the gospel, the measure of the gospel means we say, you're a sinner saved by grace, and so am I. So what we need is to walk with Christ. And I want to help you to do that. I want to show you if you're missing some point, but I want to do it so that you may be drawn closer to Christ, so that you may love him more, so that you may be healed, restored, It's a difficult thing to do, but it's necessary. Because there are times when we go to talk to our brother, and they won't listen. They won't hear. 
There will be times when we go in the best of heart, the best of spirit, with the purpose of redemption, and we say, hey, what you're doing is not correct. Here's why. Maybe you want to think about this. And they say, no, I'm fine. Everything's good. What are you talking about? I'm perfect. You know what's wrong. There will be times when they entrench themselves and sin. I had a good reason for doing what I'm doing because you looked at me funny, and so I had the right to slap you across the face and kick you down the stairs. And we will have to actually escalate it. There is actually a time when someone in the church, if they willfully choose to carry on in sin, it has to be dealt with. Otherwise, that poison will spread in their life and in the church. So what do we do then? Well, obviously, now that we've talked to them privately and they've chosen to continue on in sin, now it's the time when we talk about them behind their back and we get revenge on them and we do all of that, right? Oh, wait, no. If he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If they're not going to listen, sometimes there is that situation, then take a couple of brothers, take your Bibles and sit down with the person and say, hey, this is serious here. Look at the Bible. Look at what it says. See how Jesus wants us to walk and live and act. And see how what you're doing isn't healthy for you. It's hurting you. Sin is actually poison for the soul. And we're very concerned about you. Oh, oh I'm not sinning. So here's Bill and Tim. And let's talk about this, right? We're going to sit down. You say that it's okay to stab me in the face and punch me down the stairs. Is that true, guys? Well, no, the Bible says that anger and malice are bad and that you shouldn't attempt murder. And, okay, so these guys agree. The Bible says it's not just me. I'm not grabbing a proof text and trying to attack you. I'm not hurting you. I'm not here for anything negative. I'm here to help. You take the two or three so that it can be seen. This isn't just a he said, she said. This isn't just a you against me. This isn't just a misunderstanding. But you take people who are filled with the Spirit and you go and you deal with them. Why? Because anybody can have this kind of brokenness. You remember the story of Paul and Barnabas? Now, how many of you guys think Paul was a pretty good Christian? Fairly up there, right? And Paul and Barnabas got in a fight over John Mark. And it got so bad, actually, that they had to part ways and do ministry separately because they couldn't stand. Paul thought John Mark was a turd and useless. And Barnabas thought he was very useful. Well, guess what we find later on in Paul's gospel, or in Paul's uh, uh, writings? He says, John Mark is essential to him. He's one of the most important and faithful brothers. Paul had to learn that he was wrong about John Mark. Everybody has areas where they need correction, where they need to grow, where they have a blind spot, where they're missing something. And so to come to them again in the spirit of redemption, in the spirit of brotherly love in the spirit of not, I'm going to try to fix you, but in the spirit of care will actually produce righteousness in their lives. And if this person is filled with the spirit, if this person is a believer, then as you're sitting and talking, the spirit is tapping on their heart and saying, hey, this isn't okay. So you go to them, you talk, if he still refuses, then you tell it to the church. You come and you say, hey, church, here's a situation where someone is walking in rebellion against the Spirit of God. Not against me, not against you, but against the Word of God and against the Spirit. And you, you let everybody know, hey, guys, this is the situation. It's unpleasant. It's unfortunate. It's not nice. It's not something that we want to do. But you bring it before the church and you say, we all need you guys to know that this situation is going on and this person is unrepentant. And again, the purpose is not to say, look how bad they are. Let's all stand there and say, aren't you bad? Aren't you bad? Aren't you bad? The purpose is for redemption. First, for the protection of the church. Hey, guys, if you're sitting down and you're saying, wow, this is someone who's obviously walking with God really well. It's someone I should listen to. It's someone who's a mentor in the faith. No, it's not. This person is in rebellion against God. That needs to be known. But also, it's so that then the church can be praying and caring and looking for redemption for that person. Not looking and going, well, aren't you bad? Aren't you terrible? Because the standard that we use is the standard of the gospel. We are all broken. We all stumble in many ways. We all need healing from Christ. And when we refuse that, things go bad. 
And it's not okay to just let it carry on. And that's true for each of our lives. When we have sin in our life, it's not okay to say, oh, well, yeah, but it's not that bad. It needs to be dealt with because God says, be holy as I am holy. He says, I'm a holy God, and he wants that for us. Not because otherwise he'll smite us, but because when we walk with him, we have true freedom in Christ. And that is intention for us as individuals and for the church as a whole. So he says, bring it before the church. Now maybe they're stubborn. Maybe even then they refuse to listen. And he says, okay, then treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Now how did the Jews treat Gentiles and tax collectors? They left them over there. They didn't have anything to do with them. Well, why was that? Was it Jesus saying that because, you know, finally, if they've gone that far, you have the right to hate them. You have the right to hurt them. You have the right to look down on them and judge them. Is that what Jesus was trying to say? No. But that if someone is walking away from Christ, make sure they have the room to experience all the pain and the suffering and the sorrow of sin without any sort of cushion of the church helping, loving, and caring them. Let them remember what it's like to be an unbeliever. Because then they're going to remember exactly why we walk with God and why we are the church and why we're part of it. The purpose is always redemption. It is never to do harm to someone. Jesus sees this as so important. He gives us all the truth following this up. He says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Jesus is saying to these people, you actually have the Holy Spirit in you. And when you as the church gather together, the Holy Spirit is at work. And this is both a promise and a threat, by the way. When you are gathered, Jesus is here. He's watching. He sees. He knows. We never operate as just a bunch of humans doing human things and then at certain times we gather together and God shows up. But when two of you are gathering privately together, brother to brother, when two or three have to come to talk to somebody, when the church gathers as a whole, then God is here and God is at work and God is watching and God cares that we live, that we act, that we work as the body of Christ. That we do not allow human thoughts, human emotions, or human actions to slip in to the way that we would care for each other as a church, even when it comes to difficult things like church discipline. You know, one of the marks of the church, according to the reformed or the reformers, was that there was church discipline. What do they mean by that? That the leaders would go around beating people anytime they got out of line? But they said it matters that you deal with sin in your congregation, that you grow together, that you don't allow people to just say, well, I'm a Christian and everything's cool. That you actually say, hey guys, if we're the body of Christ, then we have to walk with Christ. And if we don't walk with Christ, if we choose to carry on in rebellion, if we choose to carry on in bitterness, hatefulness, whatever it is, then we will have a weak church. So we must do what it takes to be strong. Not because we hate people, not because we want to throw people off the bus, but because we want redemption and restoration in people's lives. There will come a day sometimes when someone says, no, I don't want any part of that. Years ago I had a friend, and I think I told you about him, and he decided, he's a good Christian, but him and his girlfriend were going to move in together and, and live. And he was a believer, he knew this, and I said, dude, what are you doing isn't right. See what the Bible says. You shouldn't be doing this. He said, well, yeah, I don't think God cares. I said, dude, God does. You've got to choose. Do you want to go God's way or do you want to go your way? He said, well, I guess I want to go my way. I said, good, at least now you're being honest. You don't want to have anything to do with Christ. And he went off and he did his own thing. But that's important that people understand and know there's only one way if you want to be a believer, and that's Christ's way. And we all... Me, right on down, stumble in many ways, right? Like I've told you before, I'm a massive jerk. Have you noticed that? If you haven't, you will. At some point, you will notice I'm a massive jerk. And when I am a massive jerk, 
I have to repent. When I do something wrong, I can't say, well, I'm a pastor, so I'm okay. I have to model repentance just as much as everything else for you guys. Each and every one of us have that duty, that task, to walk with God, to love each other, to care enough that we're willing to sacrifice for one another. Philippians gives us the command, we're going to read it at the end of the service, to value others as greater than yourself. What does that mean? When your brother sins against you, you look and you say, they're more important than me, even as they're hurting me. Oof, that's hard. But the purpose is redemption, because whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, where two or more are gathered. He's there with us. This isn't, by the way, talking about some mystical thing where in order to have Jesus present, you have to gather together, and if you're by yourself, he's not. But he's reminding us, guys, when you get together and when you, you do church stuff, you're not just a bunch of people who can have all of your feelings and interactions as a bunch of humans. You are the hands and feet and voice of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth and to each other. That's heavy. It's awesome, but that's heavy. So this is our core call of ministry, not to be the perfection police, but to bring healing and grace to people. And when this cannot be achieved because someone's heart is hard, we're called to grieve for them. We're not ever called to be gleeful or excited because now we get to bring the pain. But we should be broken when someone is broken. We should be sad. When we watch as sin takes over someone's life, we should be shattered when we see the pain and sorrow and suffering that is about to happen in that person's life. And we should be ready and willing and able at any moment, at the drop of the hat, to restore and to redeem when someone comes in repentance. How do we want to be treated. Next week, guys, we're going to tie into this even more because Jesus wanted to make this point so strongly he gave a parable. He said, if you think you can get away with unforgiveness, let's talk about what you've been forgiven. And he's going to tie into us. And we're going to leave it hanging for that. <laughs> when my brother sins against me, my heart must be with Christ love and care for him deeply and call him back to life. This world loves it when we shoot the wounded, when we push people off the bus, when we cancel, condemn, attack, and destroy. This world tells us that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of place and that when someone sins against us, we have the right to pay them back, to cause them pain, to hate, to devour, and to harm them. We're taught to talk about people, to tear them down, to teach them that lesson they so richly deserve. But Jesus calls us to a whole different way of thinking. If they listen to you, you gain a brother. The battle here is the heart. We're called to be like Christ, to love the unlovable, to sacrifice for those who are not worthy. We're called to bear all things, Believe all things, do all things. We're called to trust totally in Christ for our value, our satisfaction, our healing, and to care for others no matter what. We're called to do it the Jesus way. Have I made you uncomfortable yet? Making myself uncomfortable. Have I made you think, hey, this is for me? Because it is. CCF, I am leaving off preaching now and I'm getting to meddling in your lives. Oh boy, am I meddling in my life. What's happening? This is a hard one. I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm not talking to someone across the way. This is not one of those messages that's, that is like, oh yeah, I know a guy who really needs to hear this. This is us. We need to know this. This is one of the things that will kill a church more quickly than any other thing. When we spend our time stewing on problems. When we spend our time focusing on sin. When we spend our time digging into what's wrong with other people. This is for us today. Do you have something against someone today? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Jesus has commanded us to do something about it. Commanded us. If I say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if I say that Jesus is Lord, then I do not have the right or the privilege to stay one more. What do we want to achieve in our life and in our faith? Do we just want someone put in their place? Fixed. Taught a lesson. Do we want to get what we are owed from them? Or do we want to see someone restored? To see relationships redeemed? To have an opportunity to love others as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. This is the mission of the believer, to be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Christ. So today, let's do it. You hear me? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, this is a, this is a hard one for all of us. Because, yeah, People sin against us. People hurt us all the time. People pile on the grief and probably don't even know what's going on. Help us to be quick to love. Help us to have your heart that looks at those who would do us harm and says, I love them. That says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Help us to be your people and to do things your way every day. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you. In Jesus' name. We come to the end of the service and I often try and pick a song that kind of goes with the message.